The day was early, or maybe the night had just begun. But the streets of YouTube are darker than the barrel of a gun. So I loaded up with scotch and with lead and set out on my latest case, reviewing Dashio Hammett's The Maltese Falcon, which is, I'm sure you know, one of the first detective noir, hard-boiled and hard-drinking, crime-fighting private eyes, lauded by no less a voice than Raymond Chandler, as one of the finest examples of crime fiction anywhere and any time, specifically up to the day Chandler died, one suspects. But this novel, first published in 1930, was and remains very influential in the crime genre, hence this Crime Masterworks edition. The Maltese Falcon begins with Sam Spade and his partner Miles Archer meeting one of those girls people used to call a knockout. Miss Wonderly arrives seeking help to locate her sister who's cohabiting with Floyd Thursby. She needs to return her sister to the family home before the parents notice her absence. She has arranged to meet Thursby and Archer is to follow him from the meeting and find where the sister is. This simple plan is slightly complicated by both Archer and Thursby ending up dead. The police suspect Spade killed Thursby for having killed Archer, and then they suspect him of having killed Archer for having an affair with Archer's wife. Spade is unimpressed and sends them packing. Spade is then visited by Joel Cairo, who threatens him with a gun he is soon violently relieved of, but then tells Spade he will tell him $5,000 for the black bird. Spade spends some time chasing around after one Lily, seemingly frustrated by her keeping from him what is really going on. But he soon runs into the fat man, aka Mr. Gutman, who tells him that he wants the Maltese falcon, a priceless relic from the age of crusading. He will pay handsomely for it, suggesting it is worth perhaps as much or even more than one million dollars. This is 1930, remember. Spade strings him along, believing that Wonderly, now revealed as Miss O'Shaughnessy, knows where the falcon is. The people looking for the bird fall into two camps, Cairo and Gutman and a thug called Wilma, with O'Shaughnessy and Spade in the other. O'Shaughnessy disappears and a ship is mysteriously destroyed in a fire. The ship's captain turns up at Spade's office with a falcon in his possession, but bleeds out from gunshot wounds. O'Shaughnessy calls Spade, asking to meet him, and no sooner are they together than Gutman and friends surprise and threaten them. Spade laughs at their menaces, knowing that as long as they know where the falcon is and don't say where, that, where it is, then they are safe. He proposes an alternative solution, but can he get away with the cash, the girl, and his life? The story, as detailed, contains a lot of back and forth, a little bit of investigating, but some real red herrings and quite a few oddball characters. Spade himself does um, a little digging, but not really that much. What he does is closer to giving out lengths of rope and letting people hang themselves. As they assume that he knows more than he actually does, he keeps his cards close to his chest. It does make for some entertaining back and forth, especially in the first scene with Joel Cairo, Cairo is a fop trying to play a tough guy, and Spade, held at gunpoint, soon turns the tables and unravels the first real step in the mystery. Then, however, dismissing Cairo as a threat, he returns his gun and is immediately held up again. Cairo is more than he seems, and Spade himself is amused by underestimating him and his tenacity, though still largely in control of the situation. This is also fairly typical of his interactions with Gutman, while he generally holds the whip hand over Wilma, Gutman's employed thug, giving him the slip at will and using his contacts to thwart Gutman's efforts to find the Falcon with the police particularly being ineffectual and something of a laughing stock at points. The muscle, i.e. Wilma proving rather toothless and O'Shaughnessy being a simpering drip, it leaves the movie without an antagonist that's really worthy of the name. Investigating the Falcon mystery rapidly supplants the deaths of both Archer and Thursby. Occasionally the evasiveness of the parties involved makes things frustrating. About halfway through I wondered if the Falcon was going to be one of those MacGuffins that doesn't actually exist and has all the parties running around on wild goose chases. That turned out not to be the case, perhaps a little later than the revelation should have been made, but generally the story holds the interest well enough. Scenes are rarely laboured, with the exception of one that I'll get to in a bit. There are issues with the character which might have been in part due to me expecting a more Marlowe-esque lead, wisecracking his cynical way to the root of the matter. Hammett puts a lot of stock on people's emotions, particularly the outward manifestation of them. But before you can get a payoff from those, he has to describe everybody in great detail. This is the first paragraph of the book. Samuel Spade's jaw was long and bony, his chin a jutting V under the more flexible V of his mouth. 
His nostrils curved back to make another smaller V. His yellow-grey eyes were horizontal. The V motif was picked up again by thickish brows rising outward from twin creases above a hooked nose. And his pale brown hair grew down from high at temples. In a point on his forehead, he looked rather pleasantly like a blonde Satan. This level of detail is, I think, something of a relic, or at least much rarer in modern times, but interesting to consider. All these Vs suggest the spade is a straight dealer. Perhaps a man who turns this many arrows on something is somebody who will devote themselves to seeing whatever it is all the way through, while that blonde Satan line suggests a degree of double dealing, perhaps, a dichotomy between the blonde, generally associated with the angelic in older times, and the fallen and the damned. Certainly hints at a duplicity about Spade that is very much shown rather than told. The caring business owner smoothly dealing with O'Shaughnessy is the same heartless swine that has Archer's name removed from the door before his blood is even cold, who freely admits that he never believed O'Shaughnessy's story but took her money anyway. Spade is done quite well. Initially, O'Shaughnessy is a different ballgame. Her whining melodrama and obfuscation are frustrating to read. This is just one example. Must they know about me at all? I think I'd rather die than that, Mr. Spade. I can't explain now, but can't you somehow manage so that you can shield me from them so I won't have to answer their questions? I don't think I could stand being questioned now. I think I would rather die. Can't you, Mr. Spade? But the frustration is Spade's as well. The question being why he puts up with it at all. And the answer isn't entirely money. That V-shaped focus, and despite embracing a reputation for the seedier side of the job, which is just a front for those underground jobs that pay a little better, apparently, he always was just focused on getting answers. It's one of those performances that even other characters describe as wild and unpredictable and a bit of an emotional roller coaster. But it is pulled together well, and we will talk about the last scene in a little bit. But with so much focus on external appearances, we should expect them to be misleading. Spade is described as his eyes were shiny in a wooden Satan's face. Difficult to read, but definitely conniving. Gutman too wears his heart on his sleeve, but also is resorting to obfuscation. The fat man smiled too, but somewhat vaguely. Happiness had gone out of his face, though he continued to smile, and caution had come into his eyes. His face was a watchful-eyed, smiling mask held up between his thoughts and Spade. It isn't all perfect. Spade's attempts to play off a dangerous standoff as a practical joke when the police get involved is ludicrous. The idea that the weakling Cairo could stand up to a night of 1930s-style police pressure is even more so. Hammond needs to detail everybody's action, and that slides into overwriting. At times, this is the worst example. He put an arm around her shoulders and led her over to his swivel chair. He kissed the top of her nose lightly and sat her down in the chair. He sat at the desk in front of her, he said, and then it carries on. It reads rather like a shopping list and desperately needs some variety. But in a mystery of the highest order, driven by a character of mostly the same level, the last scene of the book nearly flubs the whole thing. It isn't so much that it's bad, it's that the book is over and doesn't need the same thing said over and over and over again. But if you have to say something five times in the same way, I'd suggest that four of them are redundant. You never get the idea here that the lady doth protest too much because the point of it is that Sam is the honest man, the do the right thing man. His reputation for the opposite is just a reputation. You can't see through somebody from the beginning and be in love with them to need this level of denial. It's redundant, as is most of the scene that just goes around in loops until it's merciful ending. In conclusion, The Maltese Falcon is one of the texts that began the definition of a genre. As such, there are still those signs of an author working out what that genre is going to look like. It doesn't have the same cynical panache as Chandler, not even close. Spade is erratic and not very likeable. The mystery takes a long time to be one, and it's almost disappointing that it does, rather than just explore the madness of obsession or the pursuit of a holy grail. However, despite almost flubbing the landing, this remains engrossing, a thoughtful, mostly well-written exploration of men, of greed, of feminine power, a subtle look at appearances and how we use them, a slice of his time perhaps, but by the end it feels that the erratic spade is perhaps as real as you and I, and perhaps even timeless. It is a good book, and though it was a huge influence on Chandler, I think I would recommend the student over the teacher in this instance. Thanks for watching, hope you liked this video, like and subscribe for more. Hello, thank you for staying to the end. If you did that, you're probably 
the sort of regular viewer that knows that they quite often sneak a little extra something about the book or the review into these final parts of the video. However, that's not the case today. Today I'm doing something slightly different. Just, I'm going to tell you that I thought that it was time I put my money where my mouth is and I have written a book. We're still in, in the very early stages of writing and drafting. So I'm, what I'm looking for really is that if somebody wanted to help out with that, perhaps be like a test reader or do a little bit of proofreading, that's basically just picking through, finding all my errors and pointing them out so that I can fix them, then I would be very interested in hearing from you. So I'm going to put my Twitter here. By all means, you can DM me through Twitter. It's me from the future. I had to come back because that other idiot didn't actually mention anything about the story. It's set in a fictional English university and it's basically a science fiction comedy. I suppose the easiest comparison to make would be that it's a little bit like a science fiction Terry Pratchett, but obviously to claim that I would be in the same ballpark as Pratchett would be rather arrogant and perhaps rather unlikely as well. But it is that sort of zany, crazy comedy, and hopefully that has whet your appetite just a little bit. So the best thing to do, as I mentioned, would be to DM me on Twitter. The other thing would be to leave some sort of comment expressing interest but don't leave any personal details in the comments i will put my email in there so that if there's any risk of people being silly or, or anything like that then it will be entirely on my part and then you can just contact me directly without any concerns like that so hopefully i'll hear from some of you and if not just you know the the, the book itself is something that we're going to talk about on this channel a little bit more um, in the future. I don't want to be sort of pestering you and giving you the hard sell all the time, but it is something I'm quite excited about, so hopefully you guys are too. I'll hand back over to the other idiot now. I don't have Eric July or Critical Drinker levels of subscribers, so I definitely don't have any money. So if you're expecting me to paid for it, then I'm sorry to disappoint you because you won't be. Um, but if you are interested, like I said, contact me. In the meantime, thanks again for watching. Thanks for everything that you've done to help this channel get to the point. I think we think we're either very close to or might even gone past 600 subs, which doesn't sound like a lot, but I'm grateful for it. So thank you very much, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.